वेलकम आई एम डॉक्टर जैसमिन बगा एंड विद मी इज चैतन्य कुमार एंड वी आर फ्रॉम ए पैक बायोटेक इंडिया वी वुड लाइक टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू ए पैक बायोटेक इम्यूनो ऑनकोलॉजी पैनल डिस्कशन गिविंग एन इन साइट ऑन ट्रीटिंग कैंसर इन टाइम्स ऑफ कोविड नाइनटीन विद इम्यूनोथेरेपी टूडे वी आर ज्वाइंट बाई डिस्टिंग्विश एंड एमिनेंट पैनलिस्ट फ्रॉम अराउंड दी ग्लोब we have professor n k mehra who is former dean all india institute of uh, medical science ex head department of chronic disease to body research all india institute of medical science india we have dr chairman medical and hematology oncology medanta medicity hospital gurugram india we have dr william decker associate professor pathology and immunology baylor college of medicine from houston united states we have dr thomas lodi integrative oncology internal medicine and metabolic medicine the life co holistic and well being clinic thailand i welcome you all sir we also have dr dattatrey joining us senior consultant medical oncology omega hospitals hyderabad india i thank you all for being here with us today cancer as we all know the word itself creates it weakens the psyche and strength of many strong people and the biggest reason for that is a fatal outcome traditionally associated with it in the past however in the recent years technological advancements have improved the patient survival and quality of life in some early as well as many advanced cancers covid-19 has wreaked havoc in the year 2020 with excess of 15 million cases worldwide and 1.2 million cases within india it is here to stay and not ending very soon and with no vaccine approved yet the travel restrictions social distancing norms and other precautions will continue this has led to a lot of hurdle in cancer care and treatment not to forget the last decade has seen a sustained period of progress in cancer treatment globally with the emergence of immuno oncology as a serious therapeutic option since the us fda's approval of provinch and indian fda's approval of apac biotech's personalized genetic cell immunotherapy product called absidin with many other immunotherapeutic products awaiting approval worldwide chaitanya will now talk very briefly about apac biotech and our product immunotherapy product absidin so like it's been a long journey um, apac biotech was uh, set up in 2009 and since then we have been working on the dendritic cell based personalized immunotherapy for cancer patients so absidin is our product which is like in its we on which we have initiated a um, uh, clinical trial after our post clinical trial results post clinical trial results and then um, and it was basically primarily for refractory cancer patients and our results have shown um, uh, overall very good survival benefit over the uh, you know uh, 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 control groups. So, being completely personalized and derived from the patient's own blood cells and tumor tissue, we have observed uh, near zero or negligible side effect. And uh, after many years of scrutinizing uh, and uh, uh, from our drug uh, regulatory and uh, 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 our technical committee in India, highest technical committee in India, we have received the approval for our uh, absidin in uh, 2017. and uh, lately apac also signed an uh, uh, technology uh, transfer agreement with uh, uh, diagnos research limited through dr decker from baylor college of medicine who is also our chief scientific advisor and our company plans to conduct clinical trials on gli glioblastoma uh, multiforme and pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and we are talking with a lot of hospitals on the on these grounds and this uh, this month we have uh, apac biotech also you know awarded for patent for maturation and uh, uh, production of dendritic cells as a personalized immunotherapy for treatment of cancer so this is overall journey we have in in brief now i uh, just yeah. yeah thank you chaitanya for that brief description and now i would request our panelists to talk about the role of immunotherapy for treating cancer in the shadow of covid 19 dr decker may we start with you sure uh So COVID-19 is obviously um an unprecedented situation in the modern era. We haven't had a global pandemic of this size or severity in in probably the last 100 years. 
And when the pandemic uh, first began and very little was known about the virus, it was very scary. Uh, there were worldwide global shutdowns um, in every country, including medical establishments uh, in, in the United States, and I'm sure India as well. Uh, also, um, quite a bit of fear uh, in giving cancer patients their chemotherapy treatments uh, due to the immunosuppressive effects of, of chemotherapy uh, and the supposition that that might lead to um, worse outcomes in COVID. Uh, I would say the news over the last five months, the way things have evolved is largely good, at least here in the United States. Uh, with the advent of social distancing and masking, uh, that is strictly adhered to now in, in medical communities, um, we have a lot more confidence that we can give our patients chemotherapy uh, and keep them safe at the same time. So um, in most cases, uh, chemotherapeutic regimens have resumed um, and people are back to treating cancer patients more or less normally. Uh, after I'd say a delay of two to three months. So things aren't entirely back to normal yet. Um, but I think that our medical establishment has made the required changes uh, necessary to safely treat cancer patients. Um, those same types of uh, interventions have yet to permeate through all of US society. Uh, although I would say this most recent spike in cases has gone a long way towards uh, allowing implementation of universal social distancing. I think the population is taking it a lot more seriously. Um, and I think all that's good news. Uh, more good news is that we're looking to have three vaccines approved for use by the end of the year, two US-based vaccines, one European-based vaccine. Uh, of course, um, approved doesn't mean everyone gets it and the pandemic is over. We have 7 billion people on the planet that will want to get the vaccine. That's going to take quite some time to ramp up production and get vaccination aliquots to everyone on the planet. Uh, however, we're cautiously optimistic that we'll be looking at the end of the pandemic, hopefully within, within the next year, as vaccine administration um, ramps up and becomes widespread. Yeah, yeah. Let's keep our fingers crossed and let's hope this pandemic ends as soon as it can. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Decker. Thank you so much for that insight. Uh, Professor Mehra, maybe now hear you, your thoughts on this subject. Well, as has been stated, the um, COVID-19 has instilled so much of fear in the mind of the people even the doctors that everybody is only talking about COVID-19 and other diseases have actually taken a back seat. This is actually not very good for, for a disease like cancer, whereas you know that the early diagnosis and intervention is the key, it is very, 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 very important. In fact, I was surprised to see that even people at the Memorial Sloan Kettering who have primarily been working in the field of immuno-oncology have been now writing about immunity in COVID-19. But there is a reason for that because we feel, and, and they have highlighted that, that the, 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 there is a similarity, some kind of a similarity between immunity to COVID-19 and maybe cancer, particularly patients of cancer who are undergoing in, in, in immunotherapy therapy, say, for example, with CAR T cells. Because both of these situations, you really encounter the cytokine storm. The difference in COVID and cancer, uh, cancer being that in COVID, the macrophages are stimulated, and they actually lead to the release of interleukin-6 and interleukin-1. So in cancer of patients undergoing an immunotherapy here, this is secondary to the T-cell attack, you know, the T-cell attack by the um, CAR T-cells. So secondary to that, that you do have, like in COVID-19, a cytokine release syndrome, where you have plenty of interleukin-6 and interleukin-1. So there is a kind of a similarity there. The second similarity that I find in both cancer and in COVID-19 is 
that now it is becoming very clear that in cancer, there is involvement of both CD4 and the CD8 T cells. This is exactly the case as you find in the COVID as well. I think as we go along, as we will um, go along in immunotherapeutic trials, uh, and I will, towards the end of my talk, at the end of the panel, I will really talk about some of the new studies that have been done uh, highlighting the heterogeneity of the dendritic cells because your own product is based on the dendritic cells and now dendritic cells are not just one single cell that we knew in the past. There are a number of subtypes that have become known and that would have uh, implications in, 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 in therapy in times to come. Thank you very, very much. I, I just wanted to give this initial remarks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Professor Mehra. Dr. Wade, maybe now hear from you about the clinical aspects as regard the role of immunotherapy is concerned. I think as a, as a clinician, you're faced with a dilemma that uh, as you treat your patients uh, with uh, the immunosuppressive and the anti-cancer therapies, the body immunity obviously takes a hit and as we know that uh, a lot of data which has emerged from Wuhan, from Italy, and from other countries, that uh, wherever the virus struck cancer patients, the severity of the disease was uh, more intense, and the outcome, especially for those who were on active treatments, was adverse as compared to the non-cancer patients and non-chemotherapy or non-cytotoxic patients. Now, where does this, that lead us to? So there is a, there is a need uh, for uh, therapies in the treatment of cancers whereby we do not immunosuppress these patients. And cell-based therapies like the dendritic cell therapies actually become an attractive option for such patients. And uh, uh, also the number of visits and the amount of monitoring on account of the medication the patient would need is minimalistic. And as you very rightly said in the opening remarks, that uh, Chaitanya said that, that uh, the uh, side effect profile is so good, it's a minimalistic or almost like a near zero side effect. And the therapy would be an outpatient therapy and, and that would become an attractive option. However, having said that, that seems a little simplistic. The research on, on this front needs to be uh, more uh, intense and, and uh, speedier so that uh, the therapy could realize the benefit for many other cancers apart from whatever the indications today are as an approved FDA, US FDA or the Indian FDA. So the number of cancers which should fall within the ambit of treatment with the dendritic cells or the other cell-based therapies has to rapidly increase and therefore we will need more research and a quicker research to realize that. Dr. N. K. Mehra and, and uh, Dr. Decker both have very elegantly uh, told us about the uh, immunology of uh, COVID-19 and, and uh, what does it mean uh, with respect to cancer. I'm not an immunologist, I'm a clinician, but the point is so valid that uh, there are certain similarities, the way the disease strikes on account of the viral infection and, and how other uh, uh, immunological, uh, uh, the, the repertoire is unfolded in these patients. So I would look for therapies which are less toxic. You cannot have a non-toxic therapy. That is not a realistic approach in cancer. Less toxic, more outpatient, minimalistic as far as the, the side effect profile is concerned, minimalistic as far as the monitoring goes, and then the patient merely need to come for a quick outpatient infusion and then the patient is gone home. And then the monitoring could be done less frequently, say about two to three months, and, and hope that the pandemic wanes away and fades away quicker than we've been thinking about. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, sir. you. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. Maybe now have Dr. Datta Tre. Yes, madam. Yes. Uh, I completely agree with Dr. Ashok Vaid, sir, that on one hand, we have to make sure that my treatment does not harm my patient. And on the other hand, the immunity is going on. 
and the immune system with chemotherapy gets suppressed or depressed. And at that time, by chance, there is the COVID strikes, then it creates havoc. I think that's exactly the place, the place where I'll be more comfortable on two aspects. The efficacy against the cancer should not be compromised. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the patient should have minimum immune suppression and immune, immune depression. That's exactly the place where immune therapy comes in picture. And especially uh, dendritic cell therapies will go a long way in making sure that the immune system is not compromised, the cancer is kept in check. If it can be curbed and controlled, nothing like it. So two things, cytotoxic chemotherapy is going to definitely suppress the immune system. And if the patient already is having COVID pneumonitis, or if the patient is prone to get COVID-19 uh, disease, then these are the places where dendritic cell therapies will be definitely a huge advance to tide over the crisis, number one. Number two, serve as a bridge between the main cancer treatment as well as uh, the patient's cancer not uh, uh, going out of control. So I agree that dendritic cell therapies, immune-based approaches, immune therapies are a far better option than conventional cytotoxic chemotherapies in this COVID-19 pandemic era. That's what I have to say right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, doctors, for that deep and valuable insight. We move on further. Uh, Dr. Decker, I would like to ask you how, according to you, immunotherapy has traveled in the last decade from, uh, from the bench to the bedside. Well, it's been a very long journey. Um, it's been something like 100 years since uh, scientists started insisting there was some interface between the immune system and cancer. Um, but it took until 2010 uh, for that concept to actually be translated to clinical medicine, uh, despite the obvious uh, interaction between tumor and the immune system uh, at, the, at the scientific level and in animal models, um, every time or most times or frequently when things were attempted in human populations, they didn't work. So we had two very big watershed events in 2010. One was the approval of the first checkpoint inhibitor, ipilimumab, for the treatment of melanoma. Um, this was at the time a blockbuster drug. It increased long-term survival in melanoma from about 10% to about 20%, and that might sound not very impressive, um, but if it's doubling long-term survival, and if, of course, if you're in that extra 10%, it's very meaningful to you. The other big watershed event was the approval in the United States of the first personalized cancer vaccine, Provenge, for the treatment of prostate cancer. Um, this particular vaccine, which uh, has changed hands now uh, twice, it's gone to, to its third, it's on its third company, uh, is still around and it's still with us uh, because it actually provides patients with uh, asymptomatic but metastatic prostate cancer a genuine option uh, that helps to extend their lives. Um, checkpoint inhibition, uh, on the other hand, is clearly uh, the dominant paradigm now in oncology as in oncologists try to make that particular kind of therapy a part of every cancer patient's treatment regimen. So after the advent of ipilimumab, oh, four years later, we uh, got an even better checkpoint inhibitor treatment, anti-PD-1 therapy, uh, drugs that block the PD-1, PD-1 ligand pathway. Uh, and those have been shown to be far more efficacious, most likely uh, because they're, it's far less toxic and therefore can be given at higher doses. Um, Anti-PD-1 therapy now plays a critical role in innumerable types of cancer and the list grows ever longer every day. Um, and if you go to the clinical trial registry and look at what's happening there, you see that uh, investigators are trying to apply anti-PD-1 therapy to increasingly large numbers of tumors with, in many cases, even probably a majority of cases, success. Um, diseases that you've not heard of associated with checkpoint inhibitors, I can tell you, have entered late stage clinical trials after very exciting phase two data uh, that have shown uh, strong uh, anti-tumor responses when given anti-PD-1. And this 
paradigm is only increasing um, as many, many different um, companies, uh, big banks, hedge funds, investors are trying to find the next generation of checkpoint inhibitors and are looking at all kinds of different immune pathways uh, with which to add synergy to anti-PD-1 therapy. Um, this is only good news for dendritic cell immunotherapy. So as everyone knows, I'm a big believer in dendritic cell immunotherapy. Uh, the problem is uh, you can make fantastic anti-tumor responses with dendritic cells, um, but the tumors are still good at knocking them down. And therefore, we're going to need these checkpoint inhibitor therapies or other types of therapies uh, that will allow those beautiful immune responses that you generate with dendritic cells to be perpetuated. So in actually just 10 short years, we went from nobody really believes there's an interaction between cancer and the immune system to everybody understands that that interaction is the future um, of of oncologic medicine. So it's been a really exciting decade and we look for it to only become more exciting in the next decade. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. So. Professor, may I, may I request you to now talk about how immunotherapy has progressed in the last decade from, yes. Yes. from bench to bedside. Yeah. It's possible for me to show a couple of slides. All right. Um, can I share a screen? Anyway, this yeah. slide really talks to you about the future prospects in cancer therapy. You know, earlier we used to have only three things, the surgery, the chemotherapy, and the radiation, and then joined the immunotherapy there, NT-AD1, the, the checkpoint inhibitor. This slide shows you the 10-year sort of uh, advancements as we see, the future might see, that the colors will change in 2016, we had still surgery, chemo as the major uh, sort of tools, but it seems by 2025, many more cancers may be treated by immunotherapy. And perhaps by 2035, this scene will totally change. The cancer may not completely disappear, but, the, but it will be con controlled by immunotherapy. Cancer may actually become one of the chronic diseases there. This has already been talked about the, you know, the CTLA-4 and the antibodies to CTLA-4 and it makes the T cell very active and all. But the major uh, immunotherapy would actually, to my mind, will be for the PD-1 because it acts as the effector phase. It, it, it acts as the effector phase and therefore the tumor cell, if you use the NT-81, it really uh, activates the uh, cytotoxic T cell and leads to the killing of the, of the tumor cell. But what I wanted to talk about were the current issues in PD-1 blockade therapy. There are three. Out of those three, one is those from the uh, academic point of to look at biomarkers for uh, responders. But I think the, what we need to really implement now is improvements in immunotherapy by making sure that, that the accessibility of the killer T cells to the tumor sites, and there is a potentiation of the killer T cell function. This is going to be a challenge for us in the next five or six years. This third very important uh, current issue is the observed di differences in terms of tumor progression and re response to therapy. And here we are talking in terms of heterogeneity among the dendritic cells. And this is something that I wanted to talk to you about, the heterogeneity among the dendritic cells. You see that the on cancer, there's a very important paper which came up in cell last year in October, talking about newly discovered immune cell subtypes could actually shake up immunotherapy. And, and the cell types that we are talking about are the dendritic cells. This is a lot of work done on the mouse model there, but similar kind of heterogeneity of human dendritic cells is also seen. In, in the past, we only knew of one classical uh, dendritic cell. We used to call it as the CDC1. But, and, and then of course came up this classical DC2. These were the two major subtypes of the dendritic cells known. 
But now the DC2 type has also been further split on the basis of their transcriptional factors, the D bet and their R gamma T into CDC2A and the CDC2B. And these are the ones that we know, the, the transcription factors we know in the innate and the adaptive immune response. And one is uh, anti inflammatory, and the other is the pro inflammatory. This, these studies have been done through single cell analysis, and these uh, subsets of the dendritic cell 2 uh, into 2A and 2B are now absolutely clearly known. I don't know yet what function they will have in times to come it will be known this is a a cartoon that i got from the mm -hmm. case uh, paper there which talks about that the dcs might have at least three subtypes the classical dc one that we already know which actually alerts the cd8 positive cytotoxic t cells that we already know but the dc2 a and b are going to be very important because they are also involved in tissue healing because you not only want to sort of kill the tumor cell but you also want uh, ways and means of healing as well so it seems to us that the dc2a might be involved in towards healing whereas the dc2b will be an inflammatory cell so i think these are a couple of new things that i thought i i would let you know although i know that many of my colleagues in the panel would already know of these uh, these sort of um, developments, and um, but I think since we are all dealing with, since in the APAC as a company is de dealing with the dendritic cells, it is very important for us to understand uh, that this new direction uh, that the field is going into, looking into subsets of these cells. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Mera. Thank you. Thank you so much. Moving on further, uh, Dr. Ved, if I may ask you, how has your, exp your experience about using cell-based therapies, particularly dendritic cell therapy, and uh, in its, uh, for treatment of advanced cancers? You know, as, as would happen with uh, any therapy, uh, there are, there are uh, two sides of the coin. And uh, we know that uh, uh, there are uh, things which work. Uh, the same story may not be applicable uh, to other cancers. And, and uh, what we now understand is that the immunogenicity of the tumors is uh, now much better mapped. And a lot of these tumors are now falling within the ambit of some type of an immunotherapy approach. However, the, the, as, as uh, uh, Professor Decker uh, very elegantly alluded to, the, the major part of the research over the years, over the last about 20 years has been, because this has been a lot of pharmaceutical push as well, and has been off the shelf sort of an availability of these drugs. One biomarker, raise a drug against that, and then uh, prove the efficacy and move on. And then that's what has happened. The, the ease with which you could produce these products, and there was a huge uh, interest and a, a, a pharmaceutical push that these therapies outpace the others. And compared with dendritic cell, you have to customize it, you have to go through that process of uh, obtaining a tissue or an appropriate uh, uh, the, the tumor repertoire, harvest the cells, go through that process and, and customize the, the entire treatment. So one has to appreciate that this is indeed uh, something which, custom, which is customized to the, the patient's own uh, uh, milieu of the treatment uh, of the of the tumor and and therefore the customization produces a little bit of a slowness in the whole process and talking about our experience i wouldn't say it's a very large experience our experience has been diverse across tumor types majorly in the approved indications and some of them in the uh, sort of a more like a compassionate use and end of the road type of an approach where we had exhausted almost all the possibilities and, and therefore we chose dendritic cell. As, as far as the tolerability is concerned, already said about, I don't need to go back to that. The efficacy, it's making patients the, the live longer. It's at a minimal side effect. 
is controlling the tumors. And as I already said, there would be responses and there would not be responses. And then that's all about treatment of cancer. It's a, it's a good therapy for prostate cancer and for the other indications for the ovarians, we are seeing the responses. And then uh, even, even some of the patients have had durable responses. Prostate, they have had durable responses. And the PSA getting controlled, the serological response, the clinical response, and, and even the radiological response. So it's a mixed bag at the end of the day. And, and uh, add, add minimal distress to the patient. So we are, we are happy. Overall, we are, we are happy with the, uh, the responses and the tolerability of the, uh, the medication. Yeah, so sir, can you uh, tell us like uh, uh, if we, we want to use it adjuvantly with, uh, with chemotherapy or checkpoint inhibitors and uh, if you do have any kind of experiences? You know, Chaitanya, there, there have been instances where, where we did combine but then these are uh, these are the the patients you would remember on on your fingertips, you know? yes. and then they don't make for a, a strong case for and against. You know? Then you don't have a large scale data, and then we understand we know that there is a lot of clinical research in combining the cell based therapies with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, mm -hmm. but it hasn't come to a point where the, the approval has been given to this type of a, uh, of an approach, and and. In the clinic also, it's like a last resort type of a setting you are using. In, in the, but all that I can tell you is that the dendritic cell therapy is not adding to the toxicity of the, the uh, IOs and then uh, in whatever uh, small number of patients we have used that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank Dr. You, sir. Bear. Moving on further, Dr. Dattatri, if I may hear also from you, what are your views? What has your experience been so far in uh, using genetic cell immunotherapy? Did you say Dr. Decker, you were asking me? No, Dr. Decker, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll take it forward from where Dr. Ashok with left us. So yeah. as was yeah. rightly pointed out, I mean, what happens is that the dendritic cell therapies we are using is more like a last ditch effort. Now we are as medical oncologists bound by various guidelines and recommendations. And these therapies are right now not part of either the NCCN guidelines or the ASCO guidelines or the ASMO guidelines. But then when patients want help and they are like, okay, doctor, all the standard options have been used by us. We still want to try something. It's then that these therapies come into picture. And then the response rates are not really great. Uh, so th that's, but then the important point is I don't end up harming my patient. In the anti-immune response uh, cycle, if you see, dendritic cells are the first step. They are the antigen presenting cells. So using that first step against the cancer as a last resort, is actually not the way forward. The way forward should be using these dendrites of therapies in conjunction with standard treatments so that we end up causing more improvements in the response rates and ultimately efficacy in terms of progression free and overall survivals. Yeah. If that has to happen, we need to conduct large scale randomized control trials. And when that happens, and we end up improving upon the efficacy of the existing treatments, we'll then be able to make a mark across the entire world and not just India. So if that's the case, for instance, you take lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, the first step we now try to do is try to find this druggable target or not, and then use drugs which can be used to target that uh, abnormality and completely shift to chemotherapy to second line treatment options. If the pd one is 50% or more, then you choose immunotherapy alone as the first line treatment of choice. And now we have doubled combinations of nivolumab plus epilimumab, which you can use even in those patients who are having lesser expressions of pdl one As was clearly mentioned, melanoma, we have now 34% five-year survival rates. 
and the future is to combine target therapies along with immuno oncology molecules so that's the way the world is moving forward we need to incorporate dendritic cells along with the existing therapies as front line and then give a 10% impact a 15% impact which is significant statistically and then this will be the future and this is what we all want from you if you could help us in conducting randomized controlled trials then that becomes a solid and strong evidence to use these molecules along with other therapies be it immunotherapy or be it target therapy or be it chemotherapy so jasmine if i if i may continue from where dr dattatre has left so you know lot of approaches have been in the maintenance therapy now now realize the fact that stage 3 lung cancer we knew that treated with chemotherapy or radiation and then stop the treatment we did not know how to keep controlling the disease beyond the initial chemotherapy and radiation and then look at it the immune checkpoint inhibitor has been used post chemo radiation as a maintenance therapy when your majority of your tumor is under control and similar approach has been tested and now approved for the treatment of urinary bladder cancer as well you know that opens up a possibility for those tumors which are immunogenic and where the, the major treatment has been done and now you are trying to target the minimal residual disease with an approach like dendritic cell to keep the disease from coming back as long as we could i think that is one of the approaches which could be actually very actively looked at and then is an area of intense research yeah we also had dr musai join who had joined us but he's just mailed us that he's been called away because of a patient issue so he had to uh, sign off from the panel discussion um uh, yeah on. yeah Uh, j- j- just one small comment yes. so that dr ashok was sir clearly mentioned we can use immunotherapy as first uh, the dendritic cell therapy as first line treatment in stage 4 patients in conjunction with cytotoxic treatments or target therapies or immune therapies number 2 we can use dendritic cells as consolidation treatments after uh, uh, say for example in stage 3 non small cell lung cancer we are already we know durvalumab can be used as consolidation and number 3 you can also think of using them in even more early stages for example as adjuvant therapy after radical surgeries have been done to further improve upon the cure rates so on one hand we just heard our our, our foreign colleague talk about converting cancer to a chronic disease on the other hand we can also talk about preventing more relapses by incorporating dendritic cells early on in cancer treatment so this there's a lot of future in these dendritic cell therapies principally because they are devoid of side effects and more importantly you end up sending the immune defense against various malignancies be it whatever subtype thank you so much thank, thank you so you. much sir thank you so overall we do see a significant global shift that is towards immunotherapy be it in the form of personalized vaccines in the form of car t cell therapies and other cell based personalized therapies so what is your take dr decker on this so these are all critical treatment regimens that we tend to think of as the future of immuno oncology um and and i i think that car t cell therapy in particular um has really provided an important proof of principle uh to show just how powerful t cells can be um if they are the right kind of t cell that has the right kind of reactive tcr right kind of signaling molecules you can theoretically generate uh that kind of immune response through a vaccine approach if you can program the dendritic cells to actually generate those kinds of t cells so while that's very difficult um, at least in the short term uh, we can use it actually uh, 
since we know what the characteristics of, of highly reactive T cells are, we can uh, use CAR T cell therapy, you know, as a surrogate until vaccine technologies are sophisticated enough to actually generate uh, T cells that, that can be constitutively active and, and not knocked down so easily. Um, so I'm very excited uh, about the potential for CAR T cell therapy, um, much more excited than I was 10 years ago when I actually believed CAR T cell therapy would never work. Uh, and I'm pleasantly surprised to have been wrong in that regard. Um, so what we know about dendritic cells in general and the way they function and the way they signal, we actually do know quite a bit about the kinds of T cells uh, that we're looking for. Um, and these in particular can be identified in the body and used uh, specifically for CAR T-cell therapy rather than the bulk T-cells that are currently used. Um, most of those bulk T-cells are T-cells that even though you're putting in very powerful signaling mechanisms can ultimately uh, uh, and eventually be knocked down in, in some cases. Um, we can identify more powerful subsets of T-cells uh, that are more biologically relevant to anti-tumor immune responses uh, that aren't knocked down as easily um, and can also uh, have a capacity for memory and also have the ability to home uh, tissue homing properties so that we can start to think about getting CAR T cell therapy to work, not just in liquid tumors where the T cells can just circulate and don't have to go anywhere, but where they can actually start homing uh, to tumors. And so we actually see all of these different types of immune therapies as being part and parcel of what the future of oncology looks like, vaccine approaches, CAR T cell approaches, and checkpoint inhibitors that will perpetuate these responses, both CAR T cells and the anti-tumor T cell responses that we'll make through vaccine therapy. Um, so the, the combination of these different regimens and, and also in, in combination with other standard approaches that I don't think are gonna disappear, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, uh, are really going to form the nucleus of the future of oncology and we're excited uh, to see how, how the, those combinations will play out in randomized trials. All right, all right, thank you. So uh, we have reached the end of this session and therefore it will be right to say that cancer being the kind of aggressive disease that it is, needs a multimodality approach to be effectively countered. And with respect to that, I would like some concluding remarks from Dr. Ware, from, uh, followed by Dr. Dattatre also. So I think, uh, you know, a lot has been already said about the journey of uh, immunotherapies over the last 100 years, and particularly over the last about 20 years, when the, the pace of development and the newer molecules which have come into the market has been actually at a frenetic pace now. And the number of indications actually falling under the ambit of immunotherapies has very rapidly grown. And our understanding of the biology of the the immune system and the, the immune repertoire, as uh, Professor Mehra has very elegantly shown in his slides, is only getting better. Now, having said that, the approach uh, in the immune therapy, immunotherapy arena is turning from a, a tissue specific and a histology specific now to a tissue agnostic. Look at what pembrolizumab has done, is, is all MSI high tumors and has shown responses across uh, uh, tumor types. And as, as uh, Professor Decker said, that uh, some of the tumors we never talked about, they are uh, showing responses and, and they are uh, showing durable responses, not only responses. However, uh, what one can realize is that these therapies, having moved on from a very basic sort of approach of inhibiting maybe the CTLA-4, uh, or, or PD-1, PDL one are, are moving into the arena of the CAR T cells. And initially the CAR T cells, were, as already stated, the, for the liquid tumors, probably now the next frontier would be the solid tumors. All of them are actually going to complement each other. Nothing is going to work in isolation. And then we are finding that the Immune checkpoint, IO plus IO, VEGF plus IO, IO alone, IO with the cell-based therapies, cell-based therapies with all these combination permutations are going to emerge very rapidly. And then the cell-based therapies have a very unique positioning there that, that these are non-toxic. 
these these work in a specific manner and and probably i would say i'm not sure that that in combination with other therapies they they will only make the other therapies better and and not add to the toxicity if if you are not adding to the toxicity and getting a better response i think it can't get better than that yes. thank you so much that that's my all i have to say dr dre may dr datta dre maybe also hear from you yeah so i think uh, uh, i would like to say that number 1 uh the basic principle of medicine across all branches has been do no harm that's what hippocrates taught us and at the same time can i also have maximal efficacy against the cancer and minimal toxicity to the patient i think all these three things are taken care of by dendritic cell therapies you do no harm to the patient at the same time you might end up having maximal efficacy against the cancer and more important to the patient minimal toxicity so that's what dendritic cells and cell based therapies are there for us number 2 they should serve as dr ved gave very nice conclusion that it has nothing can work alone it has to be in conjunction so we use these therapies as an adjunct as an adjuvant as consolidation as maintenance to already existing therapies and that will be the way forward and last but not the least is united we stand and divided we fall against cancer we have realized especially a lot of immune therapists have realized that cancer can be uh, into three categories subdivided number 1 an in, an inflamed tumor a tumor already has the infiltrating t lymphocytes there but still not able to contain the tumor here you want to remove the barriers between the existing infiltrating t lymphocytes so that they can hit the cancer hard and contain or control the disease now that's an inflammatory tumor you could be having an immune excluded tumor which means that the immune cells are not able to reach the tumor but if you can make them recognize the tumor then they'll be able to infiltrate and then destroy the tumor and the last type is a immune desert which means the tumor is so bland that the immune cells don't even know the tumor is existing there so then you possibly have to make sure that tumor elaborates the antigens and then these cancer antigens are recognized by the immune system and then the tumor can be tackled so i think dividing cancer into these we have more than 200 subtype types of cancer you divide them into immune inflamed tumors immune exclusion tumors and immune deserts and then try to see where dendritic cells can fit in in combination uh, with cytotoxic chemotherapies with get therapies or immunotherapies thank you so much thank you thank, thank you. you thank you professor mera may be hear from you also professor make a yes comment yes please uh, both our colleagues have talked about the toxicity suppose we are talking about when we are talking about immunotherapy the three sort of lines of immunotherapy that we use today car t cells or checkpoint inhibitors or the dendritic cells that you have Uh, we are all the time talking about the toxicities and this is of course the immune mediated toxicities that we are talking but at least in car t cell therapy it is already known that we have this cytokine relief syndrome there so there we need to learn how to inhibit this innate mediated innate immune response mediated crs or this cytokine storm similar would be the case over there i'm sure in times to come in years to come there will be more and more improvements and as i showed a slide that we feel by 2035 most of the cancers will be treated through one of the three means of immunotherapy thank you very much thank you so thank much thank you thank you very much so i would just like to end by saying that you know oncology is a field that doesn't stand still and after 10 years of change more advances are anticipated as understanding improves about how the various immuno oncology treatments are available and the ones which are in development also work together alone as well as in combination so thank you once again to all our reputed panelists for being here with us today thank you and stay safe and goodbye thank, thank you. you thank you thank you very much
Bye-bye. Have a good evening and a safe week ahead. Yeah, yeah same to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.